So here in the restoration hangar, we're mostly at the moment working on mostly uh, transformation projects, mm -hmm. which is to support the National Mall building and revitalization downtown. So most everything you see in here is in support of that. There's a couple exceptions, one being the flag bait back there, which is a story in itself, which we could spend hours on. <laughs> uh, but that when it gets done, we'll be here at the Hazy Museum. But a lot of the things we're doing for transformation, we've brought out of deep storage or from other locations. And they're what we just we call a dust and buff, but they're more than that. And this is an exception to that. Yeah, what is this? This is the Lincoln Standard Hispana Souza J1. It's a mouthful, <laughs> but it means a lot. It tells you what this aircraft's history is. Yeah. During World War I, uh, we had the Jenny, which is out here on the floor, which was the main trainer for the U.S. Armed Forces that were going to go to France. Yeah. And we didn't have enough of them. So the, the government went to contract with the Standard Company to build uh, military trainers and they built about 1800 of these and only several hundred made it to the theater over there wow. so the rest of them the war ends the rest of them are here in the states and unlike world war ii where we we scrap everything because we don't want to uh, hurt industry yeah aviation still new we don't know what is and isn't going to hurt yeah so they let standard do whatever they want with them so you could we have actually magazines articles that show you you could buy one in a box or you could buy oh, an entire yeah. train box car load <laughs> of these aircraft. Oh they would sell them to them, you know, just to get rid of them. Well, one of the problems with the standards that yeah. they had, it was uh, highly susceptible to fl uh, flaming out. The engine that came with it was a four cylinder engine as an American engine and it would catch fire, which is not great on wooden, <laughs> no, wooden fabric imagine. airplane. So one of the companies that would buy these was the Lincoln Company in Nebraska. So standard was up in New Jersey, but the Lincoln Company would buy a, bu a bunch of these by the box loads. Oh, man. And then they would retool them, refit them with a Hispana Souza engine under the Wright Brothers, the Wright Company's uh, contract. And they would put this V8 in here. Oh. So this, this particular transformation artifact is a complete restoration. So this is an example of a restoration. We do everything from fixing paint to a complete rebuild. What is the fidelity you're trying to maintain to the original materials? We like to save as much of the original always as possible. Yeah. And sometimes if we take stuff off because it needs to for structural integrity, right. we will even save it because somebody might come along later and want to see how did they make it in 1918? Right, because right, right. otherwise you lose that engineering uh, evolution at that point. Do you use the same glues that they were using back then or is it something slightly more modern? Well, in this case, we'll use a modern uh, replacement because the original glues and other epoxies they were using at the time were very flammable. Got it. And they they have a degradation rate that's much higher than what we could uh, replace now. Yeah. So yeah. in this case, we're not using anything synthetic. We are using a natural replacement, but it's less flammable. I love these like witness marks of the shift in your laminate. That's just incredible. So when we received this out of storage, this, we'll just back up a little bit. Yeah. This aircraft flew, it was a 1918 aircraft. It flew until 1964. Oh my gosh. So it had a, a quite a bit of wear and tear in its history. Sure. In fact, it had been restored for flight several times in the process. So, so the when, witness marks are everything. rampant. Yes. And why that's important for this one the curator who selected it wants it to be used to tell the story of barnstorming in America. Oh, right. It's going into our America by Air uh, gallery that's mm -hmm. been redoing right now. Yeah. And in order to tell that story, you got to stay true to the 1920s. Since this particular artifact, no one famous flew it. It's not the last one. Yeah, There's yeah. no um, evolutionary step engineer. It's kind of a typical. Yeah, yeah. So that allows us to leeway in this particular case, if the curator chooses to, to do something other than leaving it as is. Oh, nice. Most of the stuff we do, we leave as is and save history. But this yeah. one, we could do a full blown restoration to a period point. So for example, uh, all the control cables and, and support cables that were running between the wings, it's a bi-wing airplane. Over the years, they had uh, ink and swedges put over the wires as they replaced the wires. Well, in 1920s, that technology wasn't used or existed. So you're pulling back. So we had to go back and replace all the wiring at the cables to the, what we call the Navy five wire tuck. Well, when we went to look, go look for that, there was no agreement in the industry on how do you still do this five wire tuck. Right. So we pulled out manuals from 1920s and 30s. And lo and behold, in our collection, we had the tooling. We no. just happened to have it. Oh my God. So I had one of the restoration specialists who was like, okay, figure out how to do these cables. And he sat there for weeks wrapping and wrapping and wrapping these cables. And when he was done, his hand looked like he'd been fighting with a porcupine because <laughs> yeah, he got yeah, all the wire and yeah, got they... me. 
but he perfected it. Oh my God. So we, we were able to re reverse engineer that yeah. from the manuals with the tooling we had and all the cabling that will go back on here will be 1920s uh, specific to oh. that period. Now, so Peter Jackson has a collection of World War I planes. I've talked to him extensively about them. In a couple of them, he's actually, as he's pulled uh, wing material off of the original parts, he's found uh, drawings, like talismans embedded in the wings. I'm curious if you have found similar things in some of your planes. So this would have been on the trail and edge of one of the wings, the lower wing, in fact. Yeah. yeah. If you look here, oh, those are, at, we think, are apple barrel crates from Minnesota. <laughs> we think they're out of, you can see that Minneapolis, oh. Minnesota. So some shade tree mechanic, this thing landed once and it probably did a hard landing and banged on one of the wings right. and cracked all these ribs. So this is pre AMP mechanics, yeah, FAA yeah. requirements where you have very stringent guidance and rules how you go back in and you repair these things back to factory standard. His goal was, well, if I patch these in, I can get him flying tomorrow. I can't, um, it's so beautiful. So what we were able to do, we were able to like, take photos and drawings of these and then lay them together yep, yep. and make out, oh, that's an apple barrel or a fruit barrel from uh, some time period in Minneapolis. Oh my God. We think that had happened in around the 1920s. Even after you put the V8 in this thing, it wasn't very fast. So the last people that owned it before they donated it to the Smithsonian was a, a, a family that owns an oil company down in Texas. Yeah. They were using this aircraft, kind of what you would use helicopters for now, to survey their land and their properties mm -hmm. and their holdings. And the reason why this was perfect for it was a VW bug can outrun this thing on the ground. It's got so much wing surface, it could stay aloft and just oh, float along. And go nice Which and is great for doing around. observation work. So oh. she's not a speedster, but she's a lovely flying machine <laughs> with the right engine in her. I mean, the thing that I love about this so much is that it just, it doesn't take very much at all to feel a direct connection to the original maker. No. You know, this, this, there's so much. So we have several drawings from that period from the Standard Company and the Lincoln Company. And, but because there are variations that they would do for the customer, especially the, the Lincoln Company, right. would vary so much. They're not standard per se. The, one of the best set of drawings we found for this, there's a company up in, a, and they still exist, I can't remember the name, but they're up in Cleveland. They're a model maker company. Oh. This guy's model drawings were so precise to the original artifacts. We got a copy of those models. Oh, amazing. And we've been using those scaled model drawings yeah, yeah. to help us reproduce some of the internal workings of this. Oh so there's all kinds of things that get pulled yeah. together to pull off a project like this. I remember Peter telling me that um, the one thing he has not been able to get is that uh, BMW still has its original engine plans, but they won't release them. Yes, proprietary stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you're like, well, who else needs that? I don't know, but. <laughs> no, so he's got these German engines on his bench that he has to reverse engineer because he can't get the plans. We have, we have a rule from the way we go about restorations and projects for treatment on artifacts. It's a three-legged um, approach. You have the restorer, the conservator, and the curator. Object will come in, the three of them get together, and they discuss what is the exhibit goal? Right. What is the, what is the history of this? What is the provenance of this particular artifact? And that informs the restoration. It informs where you go and exactly. what you like. I see. And in this case, uh, like I said, we, we, we had the leeway to go do a 1920s appearance. Yeah. Uh, right now, I think the last thing they're debating between the restorers and the curators on this particular one, what will the fabric cover, uh, coloring be? Right, right. By the way, getting the proper fabric for these particular vintage models is really hard now. Most of this particular type of linen, we have to get out of England, so it's the last place that still makes that yeah. type. And we want to be accurate. Yeah. You could go with the more modern synthetic uh, coverings, but it wouldn't have been 1920s. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So is this like, a year from being done or five years from being done? We started this in January of 2017. Okay. We're now August of 2020, 21. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, COVID. Um, <laughs> so we lost about six months there, so mm -hmm. we're behind. I'd say you're looking at here another eight to 10 months and we're done. Most of the oh, heavy lift bad. of what's done. Yeah, I mean, all of this yeah. detail woodwork is what took the longest. Yep. And as you can see, most of all that is done. It's really so. In fact, so the wings are done. Uh, what, the reason it's on this, this cradle here so we can rotate it. Right. We've already, oh, I see. Yeah. we've made the envelopes that are the cloths that will go back. So the cloth, the cloth doesn't, you just don't lay it over here and then stitch it together. You make these very tight envelopes is what we call them. And they get pulled on and then, and then stitched them. down. And then oh. they, get, they get tacked to each of these ribs. Oh my God. And then there's other fabric that will go over it and you have to pink it and then you have to felt it and lay it over. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of labor that went into the, these types of aircraft in its time, from, you know, when you think about it in its infancy, but this is what the technology, this Wait, was- No, I just picture some poor kid with a coping saw cutting out all of these holes for weeks on end. Yeah, and, and it, this, so it, it was mass made in yeah. a factory in uh, New Jersey, but yeah, you didn't have CNC machines. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the fuselage. We're almost done with it. Um, so pretty, look at these Now seats. here's an interesting thing that happened at the Lincoln Company. Yeah. You can see the rear seat. Yeah. Look at the front seat. Think about an airline nowadays. That's a two person seat. Oh, wow. I don't know if that says something about the American diet or something, <laughs> but. So, and when we got this in, when, it, when they were finished flying at 64, the seat that was there was actually upside down. And we're not sure what was up with wow. that, but it was just thrown back together. Yeah, yeah. Something like as simple as these brackets here. Yeah. They look really simple, but we had to use our CNC uh, press bender, our, our shear, our uh, water jet machine, wow. and a couple other tools in the, in the <laughs> welding shop so that we could mimic how they did it a hundred years ago with a single piece. But it took all that wow. equipment to do something they did by hand a hundred years ago. I just like all I want to do is get my hands dirty and help you guys work on this. It's yes, so I do envy our specialists that do this for a living. <laughs> well, you know, the thing was is that when I got into Peter Jackson's planes, you know, when you get in a tail dragger on the runway, it's awful, right? Because you're sitting yeah, at this weird exactly. angle. But the thing that blew me away was the moment we caught air, the engineer in me could feel that the machine I was in was doing what it was supposed to do. Like, Oh, this is a machine built to be in the air. So all these interconnecting pieces, if yeah. you can imagine the wings on it, and there's a lot more wiring that's yeah, visible yeah. to you on the on a by uh, wing. That's all working together structurally. Right. So you can see why the fragility of it is that you're in combat, or like in a World War One aircraft, oh, and if yeah. one wire is lost, the whole thing can crumple because it's pulling on itself. Well, to create the structure. And I didn't realize that there was one set of wires for being on the ground and another set of wires for being in the air. And they pull opposite, opposite ways, I right. know. It's totally, it's so beautiful. And, you know, and then we move on to uh, metal aircraft after this and the, and the whole thinking of what you use for structural integrity changes. Right, 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 every last bit. Okay, so this thing, the occupant Cowan, which is actually made out of metal. metal. And, and it was made out of metal in 1918? It was. Wow, I didn't realize that. And you have like a hole here with the plexiglass, because so you didn't have lighting on the gauges. You right. used sunlight to light oh up the gauges. Oh my God, that's to be able to see the gauge? Yeah, you would, you know, it's like, like it's like, duh. <laughs> and what you're looking at here, this is horse hair. Horse hair was common for the, the Coleman. We call this the Coleman section. That's, you know, for crew comfort. Right, right. That's amazing. So you're not rubbing against the metal. And also, this is, is this a repair? It is a repair. Wow. That was a corrosion and then wear and tear. So with it, and to be honest, I don't think that was our repair. I think that was a pre-existing repair that we've had to go back and clean over. I'm just, I had no idea that they used large metal parts for 1918 planes. Sheet metal was in existence. I mean, yeah, yeah. if you look at things like uh, steam engines and locomotives, there was some sheet metal on them. So they were, forming sheet metal at that time. Were they using this green? Or do you think that's an artifact of a later restoration? I think that's probably a, a later, uh, We they wouldn't have done that kind of corrosion control probably in Because that's in such a classic aviation, like yeah, interior you'll see it like, Yeah, I see it in all the military. Inside parts. the uh, the B-26 over here. Amazing. Uh, Nelson, I just, I, I thought I had some experience with World, one plane, World War One planes, but you showed me a whole new side of them. Thank you. Every one of them you open up is a whole story to itself. And what makes it interesting is sometimes the human connection with it. Yeah. And that's what ties it together and makes it all the more important for what we do. That's totally what I feel when I see these things up close. It's such a threat.